do your due diligence and turn over every single rock to make sure that you're not making a mistake because here's the secret you make money on the buy in real estate so you have to buy it well to buy it at the right price so that you can sleep at night Hey guys, welcome to the Lumi Wealth podcast and video series where we talk about investing and entrepreneurship, and basically how to make you more money. So in this episode, we talked to Clifford Frazier and he is the COO of Equiton, which is a private REIT. Okay, so first of all, what is a REIT? Okay, uh, a REIT is a real estate investment trust. Okay, so what that means is that they take investors money and they put that money into buying properties, right? So for example, Clifford, he runs a company or he's a COO at a company where they have about $200 million worth of investment capital and they're buying a bunch of different buildings around uh, parts of Canada, South Ontario specifically. Okay? So uh, I think there's a, a great episode to learn about how to first of all, if you're interested in funds, if you're interested in REITs, if you're interested in maybe buying real estate without having to actually go out and buy a home, this is a great episode for you. We also talk a lot about you know, why you should buy a property in a certain area and what are the different types of ways to make returns off of real estate. Clifford is a very experienced individual, obviously in a very good position and his company's doing very well. I think you're gonna learn a lot from this episode, so check it out. All right, so uh, Cliff Frazier, welcome to the Lumi Wealth podcast and, and video cast as well. Thank you. Uh, how are you doing today? Very good, very good, thank you. Glad nice. to have the opportunity to chat with you. Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. Um, so just so the audience knows, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background, some things you've been doing lately? Sure, sure. So I, uh, I started in, uh, in financial services very, a very long time ago when I had uh, more hair and a smaller nose. Um, started off mm -hmm. as an accountant, actually, so don't, don't hold that against me. And uh, quickly moved over to investments and into real estate shortly after that. So I've been around. Uh, I've been around the block uh, in, in terms of Bay Street in, in Toronto. A um, lot of financial services companies, investment banks, what have you. And um, spent a lot of time in real estate lending. That's where I cut my teeth in, in real estate. And then uh, you know now at, at Equiton here, uh, been here. We launched in 2000 and, uh, 2015. Nice. That's great. Awesome. Actually, I, I have a background in real estate lending as well. What, what kind of lending uh, did, did you do as a multifamily, single family? Yeah, it was it was multifamily, single family and, and uh, condo construction loans. OK, so did, did a lot of that and then did some single nice. family, uh, single family lending as well. Great. Awesome. This, this is actually the same thing that I did um, back at Greystone in, in New York. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with the company. Yeah, familiar with the company, but never, nice. never, never got that big. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Awesome. Very nice. Great. So now you're at Equiton. So uh, what, what are you doing at Equiton right now? Do you want to explain a bit of that? Yeah, sure. So I have a fancy title at, at Equiton, but uh, it, it kind of means I get to do a lot of things. So I'm the chief operating officer here. So, um, you know, my day varies, but, um, you know, by and large, what, what we're doing right now is, is, is I focus heavily on business development. And, and educating both advisors and clients on private equity and private equity real estate specifically and the benefits right. of that and, uh, and we're getting people interested in in the uh, in the offerings that we have that's awesome it's great yeah private equity I mean we all know is, is doing quite well uh, and has been for for some time now yeah. so you're doing specifically private equity for the real estate sector that right? is cool. okay so what, what are some examples of some deals that you've worked on recently? If so, you can talk about it, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can certainly talk about you know pub publicly, uh, you know, publicly completed deals. So we we focus a lot right now on apartments in in Canada. We think that's a great way to get started in uh, into private equity and and specifically real estate. Even though you know for some people it can be a boring asset class, um, it, it's one of those uh, we like to call it a get rich slow asset. And, and <laughs> if you if you buy it Definitely right, get rich, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So you know, if you buy these kinds of assets, you know, well, and you buy them right, you can uh, you can do very well over time. So you know we're in a we're in a situation in, in in Canada, specifically in Ontario, where you know we get a disproportionate share of new Canadians coming, and they need a place to live. So apartments continue to be in high demand, and um, so you know we focus right now. We've got a, a flagship fund 
that invest purely in large scale apartments. Um, and, and we've put that together in a fund structure for, uh, for investors and advisors who have clients that are interested in that. Um, so the last deal that we worked on, we, um, one of our biggest purchases to date, uh, we, we bought a $47 million building in, uh, in Mississauga, 155 units. So that's come on board. Um, so we're just kind of working through, you know, taking, we took over the keys at the end of the year and, and now it's, it's putting into place, you know, what we call our active management strategy to really extract value out of these buildings and, uh, and, and get those, um, you know, get, get the, get the rent up, get the non-rent revenue up and really improve the efficiency of the buildings. That's great. That's awesome. So, so when you say apartment, do you, do you mean um, apartment in the sense that you own all the units and you rent it out, or is it more of a condo type no, situation? No. So, so these would be, you know, these would be purpose built apartment buildings. Um, so okay. you know, not not condos. So we we buy the entire building lock stock, and um, we we manage we manage the building, and we effectively become the landlord. Then. Nice, hey, great. So forty seven million. That's that's probably quite a few units. There, there's probably what like a five hundred. One hundred five doors. 155 155? 155. 155. 1155. No. Just 155. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Perfect. Nice. So it must be pretty nice apartments then. Yeah, it's actually it's split into two buildings. So I believe it's a seven story building and it's uh, you know prime location, Mississauga. It's it's uh between the GO station and square one. So it's uh it's very, very high demand. And and that's really what you want to look for in in apartments. I mean, we buy large scale apartments. I'm not buying a, you know, four four unit frat house near McMaster University or anything like that. So we're you know we're buying institutional grade apartments. So it's important that they are in the right location. Right. Yeah, it's important. So what do you uh, specifically look for in a location? Right. So um, I mean, this is kind of the the adage in in real estate: it's location, location, location. Sure. Right. Um, but what what specifically do you look for? What, so what, what makes we, a good location? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we're a little bit indifferent to location in, in many respects. You want to be, you know, you either want to be in a, an economic hub or you want to be close to an economic hub where people are willing to live and then travel to that economic hub. So we tend to stay away from, you know, kind of a one stop light town where there's only one employer because mm-hmm. in apartments, you know, not having tenants that's your biggest risk. So population decline. So if, you know, if you're in, if you're in a small market and you're the only building in town, um, you know, you do have a risk there because you may not be able to attract new renters. So you want to be in, in those economically diverse cities and towns. So, you know, it's, it's places where people want to live. So Mm -hmm. that's because there are, you know, there's jobs there, there's infrastructure, there's schools that, you know, there's a reason to be there or a reason to be in that city because you're close to another market where, you know, you work, or or um, or play right yeah that makes sense yeah we, and so we look for cash flowing buildings as well um so it's a little bit different strategy than than some people use you know some people want to buy you know a c or a d class building and you know turn it into an a class building so that's certainly a strategy that that can work uh it's it's value add type of strategy right correct. yeah that, that that true value add um, yeah. But that can take time to generate cash flow, and, and you have to make sure that everything works, and you have to figure out what your out is. Whereas for us, it's it's buy, hold, and improve throughout the uh, throughout the life of, of our, our ownership with that building. Nice, That's great. So you're looking for good locations. Do you, do you do a lot of ground up construction as well, or is this uh, you're buying the buildings once they're already built? So you know we we do have experience with um, with development, and um, we have purchased some. Fairly new or, or you know, new-ish buildings. You know, most of the buildings in, in Ontario, we're, we're focused here in Ontario right now. We do have a Canada-wide mandate, but, you know, we're located in Burlington, so we want to shop in our backyard. So, you know, at least I can get in the car and drive to the building if, if there's an issue. But, you know, um, right now, the way the market is, it is more cost-effective to buy existing than it is to build new. You still do see purpose-built rentals going up, um, but they tend to be on, you know, under very sort of specific circumstances. So, you know, if you're, you know, I'll focus on on Ontario for now, you know, if you're going to put a building in Yorkville and you know you can charge five or $6,000 or $7,000 a month in rent, you know, you're in the luxury market, um, you can overcome the cost of development. So, uh, you know, as an example, in some 
in some markets in the greater golden horseshoe, you know, you can spend one hundred and twenty, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a door, maybe two hundred thousand dollars a door to buy an existing building. But to try and go and build in that same market, if you could find the land, if you could get approvals, you know, if you can get it built on budget, you know, you're looking at probably closer to three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand, maybe more per door. So that so the gap between existing and new sometimes is just too high that you can't justify building a new purpose built rental because you know if you're going to try and build a building for three hundred fifty thousand dollars a door in Brantford, Ontario, you can't charge three four thousand dollars a month rent to justify the the build cost. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Why do you think that is the case? I mean, I know um, a lot of buildings. If we're talking about Toronto specifically, and I know there's people here listening from all over the world, right? Um, but we know this market. Um, so in Toronto specifically, I know a lot of buildings just came online, and not all of these are very luxury buildings, Correct. right? So, so, so in another circumstance where you'll see purpose-built rentals is <clears throat> if you know in in Toronto when they were built back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know you got these big towers that had parquets or large parking areas. So a lot of those owners are now taking those parkettes or taking those parking areas and, and putting um, buildings on there. And that's because they've had the land forever. So they can that attribute a zero cost to the land and then they're just, then they're just paying construction fees kind of thing. So it can make sense there. Um, so even though there are new builds coming on board, it is certainly not enough to satiate the demand that's there. You know, if we get in the greater Toronto area, if we get 250, you know, 280,000 new Canadians every year and 4,000 new apartments come online, it's not enough, right? It's right. Not enough. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. So, so really it's the, the land that's kind of the... We, we have the issue we have here in, in Ontario and, you know, quite frankly, in most Canadian markets is there are, you know, very restrictive uses on land. And so in Ontario, if you if you think of Lake Ontario, you've got the lake on one side and you've got the green belt on the other. So we're we're kind of locked in. So we've got a very limited supply of land. You know, cities are slow. Um, certainly, you know, the further you move outside of Toronto, the slower some cities can be in terms of giving you approvals and and you know um, pushing for intensification. And so it takes a long time to get some of these buildings on uh, you know into the market. And so what happens that drives up the demand and that drives up the price for existing rentals. Yeah, that makes because a lot of sense. As much as it's real estate, it's a product of necessity, right? So people yeah. need a place to live. If they, can't, if they can't get on the property ladder because they don't have credit, they don't have the down payment, they can't qualify for the new mortgage rules, what are they going to do? They're going to rent. And I, you're starting to see now a higher propensity for rental in in you know, Ontario and in Canada than ever before. And, you know, we're kind of behind Europe when you look at, you know, the propensity to rent there is much higher. I mean, sometimes people are lifetime renters. There's never, it's not an option or it's not even on the radar to, to get on the property yeah. ladder like we, like we do. It's kind of like New York. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you can't, I don't know almost anyone, unless you're, you're a billionaire, literally that own their own place, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and so we're starting to see that more often now here. Uh, just because it's, it's too expensive. I think CMHC, uh, Canada Mortgage Housing Co Corp, put out some stats that the average age for someone to be able to buy their first home now is pushing 37 years old before wow. you before you can buy your first place. Wow, that's interesting. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't know what yeah. Mike's going to do. They're probably just going to mooch off me for many, many years. <laughs> yeah, make sure you save that money early, right? Yeah, that's right. No, that's not going to happen. Compound either. interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool, awesome. So, uh, so what kind of advice would you give to uh, to maybe those people that are trying to buy their first home or that are trying to get into the market? What what kind of advice would you give to them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you know one of the things that I, I like to you know wisdom that I like to impart to people that are getting involved in real estate. <laughs> you know, one of the things is that not all real estate is created equally, and mm -hmm. so you know what you see in the press, you know, is largely around new homes and condos. So when people talk about, oh, there's a housing bubble, oh, the market's too hot, oh, this, that, and the other thing, they really tend to focus on single family homes, you know, whether that be resale or, or new. And so right. that doesn't really reflect how all real estate assets work. So, you know, one of the important things to, to take away is, you know, real estate's just a nice kind of broad category, but real estate 
depending on what kind of real estate, whether it's apartments, whether it's commercial buildings, whether it's mixed use, industrial development, lending, what have you, they behave differently. They have different mm-hmm. risk profiles and different reward profiles and different cash flow. And so it's important to understand, you know, what you're trying to achieve with whatever real estate you're investing in. And so right. if you want to have cash flow, then, you know, development's probably not for you because there is no cash flow in development. Development mm-hmm. pays turn at the end. You know, if you want, you know, if you want something that is resilient um, and you don't have to worry about tweets or fake you know, trade wars, then, you know, you might want to look at income producing assets like apartments, right? Because they are a very resilient asset class. You know, you can get involved in real estate through the public markets. So, you know, there are public yeah. deeds, but the, the only caution there is that investing publicly gets you kind of instant liquidity. If you, you want to get out, you want to profit take, you call your broker, you say sell, and it happens. Um, but what ends up happening is your investment isn't tied to the underlying asset. Your investment is tied to the stock price. Yeah. If the price goes up or down, regardless of what's going on with that asset, you as the investor have to bear that risk and that kind of roller coaster. Whereas yeah. investing privately in real estate, you tend not to have the volatility depending on the, you know, depending on the asset class that you invest in. So, you know, your investment in a $10 million building is based on the value of that building whether it's $10 million right. today or $12 million or, or $8 it, it doesn't have anything to do with the sentiment in the stock market. So investing privately in real estate makes a lot of sense because real estate values don't go up and down every single day. And yeah. so does your investment go up and down every single day? And so to your point about, you know, kind of the final thing that I would suggest to people, you know, as much as um, location, location, location is very important, it's really important to do due diligence. And due diligence on, you know, if you're getting involved in some kind of lending, you know, it's great to know what, it's great to know and understand the real estate asset that you're lending on, but you also want to understand the borrower. Because again, that's something that, you know, your if the borrower can't pay some, you know, pay for whatever reason, now you're stuck with a commercial building in Sarnia, Ontario. Are you, are you willing to, are you willing to do that kind of thing? So it's very, very important to, you know, to really do your due diligence and turn over every single rock to make sure that you're not making a mistake because here's the secret. You make money on the buy in real estate. So you have to buy it well you have to buy it at the right price so that you can sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah. So you can sell it and make a nice profit too. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so there, there's a lot to unpack in, in what you just said. There's a, there's a yeah. bunch of different things. I'd love I to ask you questions that. about. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, w- one of the things that kind of stood out to me is uh, I've always thought that, um, as you're saying, investing in private REITs, I think in general is a better idea mm-hmm. than the public REITs. Yeah. And I say that for two reasons. Uh, I say that because, A, it looks like the, the dividend payout along with the capital appreciation on a on a public REIT mm-hmm. doesn't seem to match what I've, or at least what's advertised for most private REITs. It seems that private tends to pay better, which kind of makes sense to me because there's less liquidity and I'd expect right. to get a better return for that. Right. right? Um, and then it's also the correlation is much less. So with the stock right. market, right? That's right. So yep. if I want to take out money, um, let's say whatever, something happens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the stock market happens to be down, mm-hmm. it's probably better from a, from a private REIT. Um, right. do, you, do you agree with those points or yeah. like? Absolutely. So we, we've been tracking some data. So MSCI um, tracks the private apartment index in Canada. And so um, we've been able to, to take a look at some of the data that they provide. And if we go back to 2008, which is everybody's favorite chew toy, but you know, when, when things go wrong, everybody <laughs> refers to the yeah. global financial crisis. So when you looked at specifically the Toronto Stock Exchange, it was down about 32% in 2008. Public REITs were down um, almost 38%. So they fell even further than the Toronto Stock Exchange. But that right. private Canadian apartment um, REIT index was up 6.5%. And that's because... Interesting. So it's, right. it's, and so think about it. If you owned a building and it was worth $10 million on, you know, in 2007, and then the stock market crashed in 2008, what's your building worth? If you owned it privately, $10 million or maybe a little bit more, you're still collecting rent. You're still paying your mortgage. You're still spitting out cash. But if you own that $10 million building through a public investment, you would have lost nearly 40%. 
of the value. But that asset is still worth $10 million, but your investment in that asset isn't. And so that's the kind of disconnect that wh- why we like privately investing in real estate. Um, you know, but it's not for everybody. You know, you really need to make sure that it's suitable for you, you know, because you don't have that instant liquidity that you have in the public sector. So it's ideal for a portion of someone's portfolio. It's a little slice that you that you set aside, you know, if it's in your in your kids RESP or something like that, um, you know, something that you can just keep your powder dry and it will tick away. And when you're ready for retirement, you know, you're going to have income and, and growth from that. Um, you know, we, we always suggest that, you know, it needs you need to look at each individual investor to make sure that it makes sense for their you know risk profile and, you know, their cash flow needs. Yeah, that makes sense. So I know you guys have a rate. It, it's uh, I'm assuming it's a private rate, right? Correct. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of um, I, I I remember being on your website, I see and I saw two different funds. Is that correct? Yeah, we've got we've got our one flagship fund, which is a, an apartment fund. So the mandate of that fund is um, large scale institutional grade cash flowing apartments in Canada. And as I said, we, you know, we buy and, and hold those and, and we've pooled it as a, as a, you know, there's really no such construct as a private REIT. That's kind of just a marketing term. It's, it's uh, essentially a mutual fund trust. Um, so, and so we just pool all the assets in there and investors can buy into that mutual fund trust. So that's been out since 2016. We just crossed about 160 million in, in assets in that fund and uh, about 800 plus doors. And uh, so that pays, you know, regular monthly cash flow as, as well as, you know, uh, share price appreciation over time. And then we've got a smaller fund called our balanced fund, um, kind of not ready for prime time yet, but um, we've just kind of done a soft launch with, uh, with that one. And that invests, okay. so that invests in multiple real estate um, categories, all under one roof, hence the balance term. So, you know, it, it invests in income producing assets that... Um, that aren't apartments, so commercial industrial mixed use. It also mm-hmm. invests in um, lending opportunities as well so as. I noticed it didn't say retail, by the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> so no retail. No retail. Retail mortgages is really the playground of the banks. I mean, yeah. you know, sure you can do seconds and thirds and mes and AB pieces and all those kinds of things and, and extract you know yield from from that, but. Um, yeah, we stay away from the, the single family residential stuff because really in Canada, the, the banks gobble up that space, right? You can <laughs> compete on price. Well, what I mean is, uh, by retail, I mean, um, you know, the storefront down the, down the street. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, as, I, I, I consider that as part of commercial. Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry for clarifying that. Yeah. I, I consider that as part of, okay. I mean, that, that is, you know, that, that can still be a good asset class, but it's, um, again, it's important to do your due diligence. Um, you know, right. I mean, as much as we have, you know, Amazon at our at our beck and call, there are still there are still certain goods and services that people need to go to a shop for, e- even if it's just to try it on. You yeah, know what I mean? sure. <laughs> so th- yeah. there's still a place for that. You know, you're never going to be able to outsource your haircut. You're still going to need a nail salon. You're still going to need to. You know, some people still need to go into the bank. Yeah. Uh, you got to get gas. You can outsource the haircut. You know. <laughs> uh, you need to outsource the haircut. Clearly. <laughs> Uber of haircuts, right? That's right. I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll get there someday. Maybe. You know, in certainly in, um, you know, certainly in what you would call, say, secondary markets, where it's the local plaza that has the hardware store and you know has the gas station and has the Tim Hortons or a coffee shop or whatever it is. It's going to be tough to get away from those. Uh, you know, even in a, a virtual world. Uh, you know, as, as fast as we're moving towards those kinds of things, there are still going to be um, you know basic staples that people need to, to get from a store. So I still think that, you know, certainly, you know, in Canada, that the commercial industrial, uh, commercial and, and retail space still, still is a viable asset class, but you have to worry about vacancy, right? More so than in apartments because, you know, apartments you can, you can fill quick if you've got a good building, whereas turnover and vacancy with commercial buildings, that can be, uh, that can be more of an issue. But again, you, you got to build that into your, into your due diligence. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So, okay. So these funds that you have, um, I, I noticed that you're mentioning lending quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So are these equity based or debt based or, they, or is it both? Yeah, both, for, both, for funds, funds. both funds are equity based funds. Yeah. Okay. Equity based yeah. funds. Okay. Great. We, we like and that then, because 
you know, people get, you know, people can, investors can get cash flow, but they also get the upside as well. Um, right. As, exactly. as, the, as the price goes up. Yeah. Yeah, because the ones where your debt investment, you know, you're only getting your coupon and you, you got to wait for your capital to come back. You don't get to participate in any of the upside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and you definitely have that risk at the end, the tail risk, right? Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, your, your capital is at risk. People forget, yeah. people forget that, right? They get, yeah. They, get they, yeah. they get hung up on the coupon and they like the coupon. Or, oh, I'm getting 10 percent. I'm like, well, yeah, but your capital is still at risk. Yeah, definitely. And and I, I think uh, since 2008, I think people forgot how bad it got, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, we have a very short memory when it comes to this. <laughs> it's like going to the casino, right? You remember all your, you know, you remember your wins. You don't remember your little losses, right? Yeah. And how you think you're ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, um, so what kind of returns um, are you guys expecting on these funds? So, so I know there's going to be a, a cash flow component. There's going to be a, a capital appreciation component, right? Yeah. yeah. So we've we've got the historic returns on our on our site for um for the the um for the apartment fund. So it's targeting a seven to ten percent annual return um, between cash flow as well as um, share price appreciation. Okay. So seven to ten cash flow and appreciation together. Correct. Correct. Okay. Great. Cool. Um, awesome. And then is this for both funds? You're targeting the same types of returns for each so one of them? The balance fund has a slightly higher targeted return of uh, 8 to 12%. Okay, 8 to 12 Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah cuz I mean, we're, when you look at um uh, you see a lot of these private REITs mm -hmm. in uh, the United States, uh, a couple come to mind, you know, the fund rises of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I feel like they're all in similar ranges, right? It all goes from like 8 to 12. Yeah. Um, I feel like every time I see someone say 14, 15, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant about what are they doing with that money, right? Yeah, or, or what kind of risk are they, are they taking, right? I mean, depending on, you know, what they're using from a leverage standpoint, that, you know, that, that can play a part in it. And yeah, depending on the assets. So, you know, in, in the U.S., certainly in the apartment space, there are um, big buying opportunities down there because you have buildings that aren't, just aren't being run well. And so because of that, you know, it's a it's not a very good customer service experience for the, the tenants. So people don't want to live in that building. But sometimes you can, you know, you can buy these buildings that have a, a vacancy issue and you can make improvements to them to, to make them more customer service centric and you can fill up the building. So there's still, you know, you can buy some of those buildings at a discount and, and, and get those kinds of higher returns. But there's, you know, risk and work that comes um, that comes with that. And right. so, you know, a little bit different than, you know, than here, um, you know, you, right. you tend not to have, I mean, there are those opportunities, but not as frequent as they are in the States, just because the, the market's so much bigger down there. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and how do you think that compares in terms of risk as well? Well, I mean, you know, you, you get into the States and it's very, very market specific. Um, so you have to, you have to really be in the right location there. Um, because, right. you know, because the country is so diverse, but it's also, you know, population, um, you know, you're along the East Coast, you're along the West Coast, there's a little bit in the middle and, and you know, everything else is kind of tumbleweeds in, in some respects. So you have to be careful where you're where you're buying uh, again, because it goes back to you want to be where people want to live. You don't want to be you know, don't want to be in a market where there's population decline. Right. You don't want to be in Detroit kind of thing. Right. Necessarily. Yeah. Um, so th that's a very very important thing, and then you've got to lay on the currency risk as well, right? Yeah. As well as as well as the tax treatment. So you know right. here, um, it, a lot of REITs, both public and private, if they are investing um, passively in income producing assets, they can have a much more attractive um, tax deferred return. So a lot of REITs can attract 100% return of capital treatment for tax purposes, which means that the that the returns that they're paying tax deferred until you sell at some point down the line. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. So let's say, um, let's say we invest into your, uh, into Equiton, right? Into mm -hmm. one of your funds mm -hmm. and we're getting distributions, Correct. right? I'm assuming if we actually take the distribution and you don't know, go off and buy whatever with it, then we'll, we'll probably get tax, get taxed as income. I'm assuming that. Well, no, the, the, no, the distributions, you know, the dist for, for our particular fund, the distribution is considered return of capital. So you don't, it, for tax purposes, so you don't pay tax today, you will pay 
tax later on. So what it actually does is those distributions reduce your adjusted cost base. So it's an ACB grind. So okay. if, you, if you bought at 10 and I gave you 50 cents in distributions, now your cost base is 950 and so on and so on as long as you own the, as long as you own the fund. But okay. is it, and I guess it could continue to go until it's negative even, right? Well, is that possible? It'll, it'll go down to zero, and then any distribution after your adjusted cost base goes to zero would be regular income. But okay. all, those, all those other ones are, are return of capital for tax purposes. So you only pay when you, you, only pay when you redeem or when you sell. Okay. And, at Interesting. That point, and at that point, you'd pay capital gains as well. Interesting. Okay, so let's say... Let's say we take $100,000, we put it into Equiton, mm-hmm. right? And you're paying out distributions. You're saying, you know, 8 to 10%. Um, I'm assuming, you know, what, 5% maybe cash flow? 6, 7%, right? yeah. 6, 7 cash flow, right? So we're getting $7,000, $6,000 per year, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then when you're doing these distributions, I guess I have two options, uh, whether I want to reinvest it. Correct. or whether I want to take out the distribution, right? Correct. So let's say on the one scenario, if I take it out mm-hmm. and I go and I use that money and I, you know, buy a new TV or, or whatever it is that you buy for $6,000, right? A, nice um, a, a very nice TV, definitely. <laughs> um, but uh, so you're telling me I don't pay taxes when I take that money out, not until at the very end when I sell the fund? Correct. And it's considered capital gains. At that point, when you sell, yes, yeah, yep. that's very, very interesting. That's actually very good tax treatment. Very good tax treatment for you know it, it's ideal for you know people that you know one have cash aside that isn't doing anything exciting for them. Um, you know the other thing is it um, you know a lot of these funds you know ours in particular it, it's available for registered plans as well so RSP TFSA all that kind of stuff. But yeah, for for. You know, for people that want to invest non-registered money, you can invest it as if it is registered money because you get that tax deferral and you get that growth. Yeah, because that's great tax treatment. It's, it's almost it's almost a shame to put that into an RSP because you'd want to put something to an RSP that's Correct. paying you regular income, like yeah, tax interest or taxable interest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, if you were try, if, say you tried to, you know, you couldn't find a six percent bond, but if you you know tried to find a six or seven percent bond because of the way you're taxed immediately on that on those bond returns you know you would have to put in i think we've crunched some numbers so if you put a hundred thousand dollars into a into a private REIT that had return of capital treatment and got that six or seven thousand dollars a year to get the equivalent return from a bond if you a, if you could find a bond um you'd have to put in a hundred and eighty thousand dollars right to get the same return so you've you know you could you could put a hundred thousand and then take eighty thousand and put it into something else if you wanted to, rather than right. stuff all in a bond, right? Yeah, definitely. And then even if we were to buy REITs on the public stage, then that uh, that gets taxed as dividends, right? And that's also a higher tax rate than uh, capital. Certain, gains. certain, yes, yeah, certain ones, yeah. And I know some do have um, return of capital treatment as well. It just, okay. it just depends. Yeah. Okay, so this this treatment can be for public REITs as well. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Great. This is very good to know. So are um, so are you taking new capital for your funds, and and what's the minimum investment? How does how does that all work? Yeah, both our both our funds are 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 open. Um, we're continuously open, and so minimum investment for the apartment fund is ten thousand dollars, and for the balance fund is five thousand dollars. So very accessible. Okay. So, yeah. So it's not that it's not that you're asking for. Some crazy amount of money that no. the everyday viewer here could be. Yeah, and it's it's available to all investor classes in in Canada. So it's not just a cred only. Like it's not just yeah. for accredited investors. So you know most provinces have um, different categories for investors in um, private. So it's accessible to a lot of people that they actually don't even know that they're they're able to invest in these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I I don't think a lot of the people know about this. Um, you know, I, I happen to come across this because, you know, I work in this industry and right. I understand this sort of stuff. Um, and, and you're right. I've, I've always found that uh, the private REITs seem to give better returns with a lower risk profile. Right. So. Well, but you give up that's, liquidity, though. That's, that's, yeah, the, you give that's up the trick. Liquidity. So in terms of liquidity, how does your fund work in terms of liquidity? Is there a minimum holding period or are there only specific times that you can withdraw money? 
So it, it really varies on depending on the purchase option, but it's really, you know, people should have a three to five year plus hold in mind because, you know, the longer you hold real estate, the more money you get to make. Um, right. But, you know, we do have redemption features in, in both of our funds. It's monthly redemption um, with okay. the 30 days notice. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you could take out. Okay, so that's not too bad, right? Nope. I mean, as long as you have some planning and yeah. you know you there have are, some money put away some, just yeah. in case. You know, there are some redemption fees during that three to five year period, but that's uh, it's kind of standard in the in the space. Right. So, uh, so what is it? So, if so, let's say I put in money today. Mm-hmm. Um, and first of all, am I able to take it out in a month from now? Is is just something blocking me, or is that possible? No, you're you're not blocked. But if people want to take a, a, a test drive, this is not the right investment for them. This right. Is, you know, unless there's some kind of hardship case, obviously. But you know, for for people that want to take a test drive, maybe take a bit of profit and move on to the next thing, then the public REIT space is where they should they should be. They should stay out of privates. Basically, it's, it's, it wouldn't be suitable for them. Not appropriate. So it's really, you know, you should really have a longer term hold in mind. And, and for most people that are getting involved through their registered plans, you know, whether it's their Lira or their RSP, they're not, they're not using that money anyways, any, anytime soon. Right. So w- what I mean by that, though, is I mean, um, so what, what kind of, so uh, is there a minimum amount of time to hold it in legally? Is there fees after? Because normally I'll tell you, like when I, when I look at these private REITs, mm-hmm. they usually have something like you can't redeem for the first one year. Uh, your money is basically there. If you if you really have to, there's some sort of fee involved. Do yeah, you have so some structure yeah, like that? There are early redemption fees. Um, okay. And depending on the first option during the first three to five years. Yes. Three to five. Okay, yeah. cool. That's good to know. So. So if we're looking for an investment long term, three to five year plus, we want to get a consistent eight to twelve percent return that has a very good tax basis on it. You're the ones to talk to, or or somebody like us, yeah, <laughs> or someone like you, yeah. yeah. Cool, that's great, awesome. It's good to know. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, is there any anything else that you'd want to talk about with um, with our viewers here? I think this is fantastic. First of all, I think, you know, I'm actually thinking about investing some in, into your fund right now. <laughs> but uh, is there anything else that you'd want to talk to our viewers about? Anything else you want to bring up? No, I think uh, I think I've given away all the secrets. Uh, but yeah, just, um, you know, do your due diligence. That's really the most important yeah. thing when it comes to getting involved in private, whether it's real estate or, you know, flow through shares or oil and gas stuff. I mean, there's there's all kinds of private equity out there and all kinds of private investments, whether they be uh, lending-based or otherwise, um, you know, my, my recommendation to investors is do your due diligence. You know, make sure you understand what you're getting into. Make sure you understand the asset. Make sure you're comfortable with the, with the relative risk. And, you know, sometimes if it sounds too good to be true, you know, maybe, maybe it is. So really, you know, really dig under the covers and, and make sure you're comfortable with, you know, you're comfortable with the asset class and you're comfortable with the people that are, that are running it. Because you know yeah. these are a lot of these are passive, so you know it's kind of hands off. So you're you're trusting the people that um, that are running these these funds for you or these assets for you to make sure they're doing the right thing. Yeah, cool, that, that great, be, awesome, uh, big takeaway. Great, perfect. Well, Cliff, thank you very much for being on the show. This is fantastic. Uh, this is a great Pleasure. conversation. Um, I, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You as well. Awesome. Thank Good. you very much. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the conversation, don't forget to subscribe. We're going to be having these once a week, so this will be a way for you to stay up to date with all the latest things that come out. And if you have any questions about what we talked about, or if you have any people that you want to bring on the show, or any topics that you want to cover, don't forget to leave comments. I'll get back to you guys as soon as I possibly can, and we're going to keep improving this thing over time. So again, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to leave the comments. And let's figure out some ways that we can illuminate the path to your wealth. Thank you.